with people who've had diabetes because of the damage you've done, then you may have to cut out carbs altogether. Hello everyone, I'm here today with uh, Dr. Werner Wheelock, who uh, runs uh, an excellent website uh, called Werner's Views, I believe. Yep. And it has uh, articles on all of the controversies around nutrition and medicine. And Werner basically goes out, gets all the data, compiles and gives a clear summary of, of the best data uh, to help inform people on many of the issues that are being discussed today. So I'm delighted to be here in Trinity College Dublin, okay. Werner. Yeah, well, good to see you in Ivor. Absolutely. And we met in South Africa there yeah, a few yeah, months a, ago. Yeah, we had a great time there, didn't we? Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to maybe just, uh, or your website, maybe a few words on how you kind of started it up and we'll talk about some of the content. Sure. Well, I have to admit that like many other people, I bought into all the conventional dietary guidelines. You know, on, on all the grounds that we had to emphasise prevention. And the big mistake I made was that I, I believed what the governments told us and what the, the World Health Organisation told us and all the rest of it. And then I started digging into the literature because originally I thought, well, everybody's living longer, so we must be doing the right thing. And, mm. But then I said, we've got all this bloody obesity. Sure. Uh, and I started digging and digging and I came across Gary Tove's book. It took me three times to read it before I got to the bottom of it. Yeah. And then uh, things dawned on me. And, uh, you know, like several other people, I had to admit that I'd been wrong. Mm. And that then uh, forced me to... I mean, at the time, I was uh, moving out of the business. But my daughter was taking over, and I had a bit of time on my hands. Mm. So I got stuck into all this stuff. and. It's been an absolute revelation. It really has. I mean, uh, and the more the more I find out, the angrier I get <laughs> at the way we have all been mm. misled and continue to be misled. And I'm now on a mission to try and get this information out to anybody who listen to me. Excellent. And you're right about it. Certainly, the anger is is a common enough thing with people who have discovered how much bad science actually informed public health oh, over the years. It, it's kind of shocking when you begin to actually research well, it properly. Again, what's becoming clear uh, to me is, is the amount of absolutely bad science. Mm. Um, and it's even worse than that because there's so much corruption as well. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of it or most of it, I think, comes down to money. I suppose it's it's it, it's it, it's money, and it's the fact that people are not prepared to admit that they're wrong. Yeah, that that's a large part of it. I yeah. think uh, having given bad advice for fifty years yeah. that everyone has adopted, it's extremely difficult for governments or any researchers to admit the whole lot was yeah, wrong. Yeah, absolutely. But sooner or later, they're going to have to face up mm. to it. And my view is, the longer they go on, the tougher it's going to be and the more damage mm. that there will be. And I see, out of all the mass of stuff there is out there, mm. a lot of it comes down to diabetes. Yeah. Di diabetes and sugar and insulin. Absolutely. I think that's got to be the starting point. And I mean, all this bit is about obesity causes this, that, and the other. I think that's nonsense. I think obesity is purely a symptom. And you really got to get down to the nub of the matter, which is uh, the sugar and the carbs. Yeah, essentially. So I think, yeah, they've got the root cause chain kind of mixed up, where obesity is causing these issues like diabetes, etc. But really, it's just, a, it's just a part of the journey. The root cause is driving everything. Yeah, uh, and uh, I mean, a lot of it goes back to the advice to reduce fat mm. and the subsequent vilification of fat. And then we had the food industry picking up on that. Fair enough, this was the advice they were given. So they said, right, uh, we'll follow the guidelines. But of course, invariably, when they took out the fat, they put in sugar and our sweeteners. Mm. And as a result of that, the uh, in 
uh, the, 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 the amount of um, carbohydrates and sugar that was being consumed uh, just steadily increased. I mean, you, you know, I can look at the figures for the UK and you can see that the, the fat has been coming down. And the saturated fat in particular has come down a long way. I mean, I remember in the middle of the 1980s in, in Britain we had this report from the official body, which was the Committee on Medical Aspects of Food Policy, or COMA, <laughs> as, a, 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 as it was known. At the time, they set a target to reduce saturated fat by 25%. I mean, that target was achieved around about 2000. Mm. And at the same time, of course, the incidence of obesity had, in, uh, had increased quite considerably. The other factor, of course, in relation to diet has been the huge growth in the consumption of soft drinks. Yeah, I bet. Uh, I mean, I go into supermarkets and I see two litre bottles, three litre bottles of lemonade, coke, you name it, and I think you might as well just put a big sign up there and say diabetes. The diabetes section. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Though it's still, originally, in, in fairness, I guess, to the researchers, they did actually believe that the fat was a problem. From Ansel Keys and all of that kind of well, work. it all it all went back to the cholesterol story, didn't it? Mm. And cholesterol was supposed to be the key ri the key risk factor, mm. and from that, saturated fat increases cholesterol, therefore it's bad. Polyunsaturates, the omega sixes in particular, we're talking about reduces cholesterol, therefore it's good, and we now know all of that's absolute rubbish. <laughs> uh, I mean, we yeah. we have. The massive Hunt study from Scandinavia, mm. what they find, they measure or they monitor the cholesterol and then they record when people die. By the way, the only thing I, I go for is all cause mortality. You, know, you can forget about heart disease and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, I, I, I mean, what benefit is it to me if I reduce my chance of heart disease and increase my chance of dying of cancer? It, exactly, and that's something people might not be so aware of. Yeah, by reducing one disease, the topical or popular yeah, disease, yeah. heart disease, they avoid looking at all cause mortality yeah, yeah. because that doesn't improve with many of these. Yeah, but what, I mean, what, what, we now, what we now know is that people who have low cholesterol, low LDL cholesterol, have got high death rates. Yeah, and. They think and it, it, it's the Scandinavian work, and it's all been confirmed in a, a recent publication by Japanese workers, and they're getting exactly the same. Now, the, the, the other side of the equation is that for high cholesterol, with men, it doesn't really make any difference. Mm -hmm. With women, the higher the cholesterol, the greater the life expectancy. I, uh, and when, I, when, I, uh, and when I, I talk to women about this, they can't believe it. Yeah, because they have been conditioned to think that if they've got high cholesterol, they're in big trouble. And the reality is, they're not. On average, statistically, they're better off with high cholesterol. Now, the causality here is quite confusing. Well, that's another thing altogether. That's a separate topic, yeah. probably more a detailed topic. Yeah. But I think what people maybe don't realise is that cholesterol does relate to heart disease in ways that are unfortunately misunderstood and for the Absolutely, last 50 yeah, years. Yeah. So if someone has very high cholesterol and is also taking a high carb diet and is hyperinsulinemic or it's high insulin, then the two can be synergistic together. But the key, the root cause is the insulin and reducing the carbohydrate and the inflammation yeah. and then the cholesterol is irrelevant. Absolutely, yeah, yeah well I mean that's really the um, shining light or, or that is to focus on the insulin. I mean, that, that's one of the things that's come across to me since I've got into this area. That, you, know, you can forget about cholesterol. It's the insulin that you need to worry about. Insulin being the metric that matters, if you will. Yeah cholesterol being a peripheral kind of measure. Yes, uh, I mean, people think cholesterol is bad and they forget about the fact that we, we actually need cholesterol. And as, uh, people like Stephanie Senov keep pointing out, 25% um, of your cholesterol is in your brain, even though it's only 2% of your weight. So it's playing a key role in there somewhere. And the last thing you want to be doing is messing about with it. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas insulin, 
when elevated or pushed higher is a genuine problem. You need the insulin to manage your blood sugar, but at the same time provoking it and driving it up and driving up your blood yeah. sugar is the real root cause of monitor, most modern disease. Yeah, well, I, I, I quite like that uh, Lancet article you put, you put oh, on yeah. to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was in your YouTube. and I mean, that shows it very nicely that if you're eating a lot of sugar, then you have to produce a lot more insulin. Mm. And then, then, then if you've got a, lo a low intake, and apparently you can cope with that for about 10 years if you're lucky, mm -hmm. then eventually uh, the pancreas just gives up the ghost. Yeah. And then you've got full-blown type 2 diabetes because there's no way of controlling the sugar and it's doing all sorts of damage inside you, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. and I think 300 million diabetics now from very low numbers 100 years ago, and they reckon over 500 million diagnosed diabetics in the next 15 years and they have five times or more the risk of heart disease. It's an enormous well, issue. Well, mm. and, you know, and it's, it's not just heart disease. Um, oh. a, fr a friend of mine was in, he had cancer and having the foot off, and they said most of the amputees were people with diabetes, type two yep. diabetes. Amputees, and retinopathy and eyesight and yeah. peripheral vascular yeah. and cancer now, yeah. more and more being explored. Yeah. But all of this, diabetes is a disease of hyperinsulinemia or high insulin, and you're insulin resistance that occurs and your insulin goes even higher mm -hmm. and then that's causing a huge amount of dysfunction and obesity of course as well yeah yeah i mean it all it all, it all comes back to that and, and for most people the uh, advice has to be to cut down on the sugar for a start mm. and on that front actually Werner, i guess out there sugar is becoming well known as being a really really bad actor so that battle is beginning to be won um, but what do you think the authorities are, are reluctantly acknowledging that now? Oh, I think the position is that uh, the defenders of the old style nutrition, if you like, accept that the battle on sugar has been lost. Yeah. But that's only one side of the equation. Mm. Uh, if we're going to make real progress, then I think we have to accept that the sugar must be replaced by healthy fats. Mm. And by healthy fats, I mean the, the monounsaturates and the saturates, um, plus the, the omega-3. Mm. Certainly not trans fats, that's not a problem, everybody will accept it, but it's, it's the omega-6s, we don't want those. No, not so much. And I suppose one, one category I have, or categorization, is natural fats from natural food so sources that we evolved on for millions of years. That's a, probably a good definition of good fats. Anything yeah. in, made in a factory and yeah, 20 yeah, yeah, chemical yeah. steps. Well, you, so you've heard the term GERF, just eat real food. Yeah, actually, and I think it's not the... Uh, it or, sums it up. Uh, absolutely, yeah. or Professor Noakes' book, The Real Meal Revolution, yeah, 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 yeah. and again, eat real food. Yeah. If people just stuck to that, even indulgent real foods, yeah. it would probably yeah. be okay. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Mm. And if people got over the fear of fat, then they could really enjoy uh, a really good diet of natural ancestral foods. But I think uh, you mentioned earlier, the fear of fat means they avoid some of the most delicious food that's in nature for us and they go towards low fat, higher carb and then they're directed into the grains and all of these kind of inappropriate foods for humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think it's difficult to underestimate how people have been conditioned mm. and the message that, that fat is bad seems to have been uh, come across very effectively mm. and <clears throat> so I think people find it very difficult to adjust their basic beliefs mm. and having been conditioned to think that fat is bad the idea that, that and particularly when we're talking about saturated fats the idea that saturated fats are, are good is a step too far for many people to respond to and that's part of the difficulty I mean I uh, just with a friend recently and we were um, in the supermarket and I said to him look 
you need if you, if you want to open, you need to buy a full fat yogurt. We can hardly find one. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Those supermarkets are filled with low fat that's foods right. now because industry built its empire on those yeah, yeah, on yeah, high yeah. carb foods. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And it is a shame. And all the natural was taken out, and all the unnatural came in. But I suppose that message, you're right. Everyone has been brainwashed effectively. I think that's fair to use that word. Yeah, yeah. Fifty yeah. years. I mean, myself from birth knew that fat was bad. It was dangerous, it clogged your arteries. Yeah. Now, an increasing proportion of researchers and the medical community realise that that was a horrific mistake. But still a majority are still peddling this trash of fat being bad and carb being good. <laughs> well, that's been a revelation to me because having been brought up as a scientist, you come to go back to the original data and if the data changes or even if your perception of the data changes then you've got to adjust your views now it seems if you haven't been trained as a scientist or even if you have been trained as a scientist people still find that very difficult to do and they just seem to be um, accept what are the basic beliefs that they've got and a great difficulty in questioning those beliefs and, and, and then adjusting to them. Yeah, exactly. And I think one thing that affects people and affected me also, it's hard to believe that everyone in authority and all the experts were profoundly wrong for decades. It, it seems so unlikely that people just think it, they can't have been wrong for so long, but what they were. <laughs> so. But th that is happening now. I mean, the sugar is the first battle, and that's being won. People are beginning to realize now, even though Professor Yudkin in the 60s wrote Pure White and Deadly. Pure White and Deadly, pure, yes. And he had it in the 60s, but he was beaten down by yeah. industry yeah. funding. Yeah. But now the sugar battle is kind of being won, and we move on to the carbohydrate. Yeah, that's going to be a difficult one, to get low carbohydrate accepted given that there are hundreds of billions of dollars of industry built on the rock of high-carb foods? Yeah, I, I think that's a difficult one, Ivor, because I, I, I quite like the, the Lustig view. Um, and he, he points out that one of the problems specifically with sugar is that fructose can only be metabolised by the liver. Mm. Whereas glucose can be metabolized all over the body. And this means that if you've got sugar, the capacity of the liver to deal with any sugar is taken up with the, with, uh, with, with the fructose. Mm. So there's a bit of a debate about um, the starchy side of things. Mm, the glucose. Uh, and I think, uh, um, I think a lot of people can probably cope with the carbs. Mm. But uh, I think I could say quite categorically that for most people, mm. it's best to get rid of the sugar. And um, I mean, Peter Attia makes the point that he can't cope with any carbs, mm. uh, with any of the stuff. And his wife can cope quite a lot. True. So I think that with, with the car, and, and again, you see, with people who've had diabetes, because of the damage you've done, then you may have to cut out carbs altogether. Yeah. And it, because of the, the damage you've done, then you probably you, you may not be able to cope with any carbs. And if you want to live a reasonable life and recover, then maybe you've got to do without all, without all the carbs. But I would say sugar, sugar number one, but then we've got to face up to the fat side of things. Mm -hmm. You know, un until we can get it accepted that fat is not the body that has been made out to be. I think it's going to be difficult to make a lot more progress in the future. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. Uh, and of course, the real, the real problem out there is the diabetes. I mean, the figures for Britain are it's doubled in the last 15 years. And I suspect that's probably the same here in Ireland, in Europe, in the States, in Australia. Diabetes, yeah, is, is huge and it's going to be more huge. Uh, so I think even that 500 million figure for diabetics, which is kind of bizarre, 
Because human genetics have not changed from 13 oh, it's not to it's I mean, to. the recent change has certainly nothing to do with genetics. Exactly. And for people watching as well, yeah, it's around 15,000 years for genetic changes to occur. But the diabetes explosion is in the last 40. Yeah, so yeah. it's nothing to do yeah. with yeah. genetics. It's to do with the foods. And yeah. that's, that's a fact. But the 500 million they're talking about are diagnosed with glucose metrics. If you did a proper test, like we talked earlier, Professor sure, Crafts, sure looking at the insulin response to glucose, you'd find there are probably more than a billion more on top of the 500 million. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, look, and then, um, I mean, uh, how many haven't got it now that will have it in five, ten years' time? Yeah, the figures... So, will, yeah. it, you're probably talking about at least half the population. Yeah, certainly in Western, like in, say, the yeah. US, probably more than half, and then some countries... Yeah. Yeah. maybe not so bad but uh, yeah diabetes is the central issue in the next 10 20 years it's going to break the world's health health systems it's it's just the suffering is enormous because you've got the amputations yeah, 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 the yeah, eye yeah. disease yeah, the yeah. heart five to seven times as much heart disease many of them pretty much die of heart disease it's oh the primary driver uh, uh, yes i'm sure it is mm-hmm. and, uh, as, you, as you say um, cancer um, I would say that there's a fair chance that it's making a significant contribution to the instance of Alzheimer's, which is a major, major problem. Came across an interesting uh, bit in the paper the, the other day where it was saying that the uh, life expectancy has increased. What is it? five, six years in, in the last 30, 30 years or so. Mm. But the, the years of good quality life has, has increased by one year less. Mm. Now what that means it, it, it is that um, for, for every single person on, on, on average, it's one more year of poor quality life. Mm. And much of that will be in a in a home of some sort. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I've suspected for a long time that the um, length of time that people need special care towards the end of their life has been increasing. This is the first time I've actually seen any hard data. All right, excellent. I must post that information here. I'm sure. Yeah, Derek yeah. Well, I'm, going, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to be mm-hmm. digging the, uh, that out. But certainly, from my own personal mm-hmm. experience, it seems that. Um, People are having to spend more time uh, being being cared as, mm-hmm. as, they get, as they get to the end of the day, and, and, and certainly um, from my own experience, you know, from my own friends and colleagues. I mean, I'm hearing about more and more who just can't can't stay at home and have to go into care. And of course, I mean that's um, another huge expense for individuals and our state. Yeah, it's kind of tragic. And of course, the technology can keep people alive for longer. So that's one of, if we had the food, the bad food explosion of the last 50 years with no medical progress, you'd see, you'd really get to see the problem. But it's been buffered by medical progress has managed keeping people alive longer. Um, so the figures don't yeah, look so we're, bad. And again, we're, 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 in, we're, we're into another whole issue. Yeah. And, um, you know, as to whether... Uh, a lot of this is justified, or whether the individuals themselves actually want it. And, I mean, in the brief lectures, Atul Gawande, mm. is a, a famous thinker in, in, in the States, um, he reckoned that um, just from his own research, talking to people, mm. that many of them just didn't want it. That rather than being hauled into hospital and subjected to all sorts of Tests and uh, fancy treatments that they you know rather just stay at home and gradually fade away with their mm. uh, with their own family and of course that's a, a, another example of huge expense. Yeah, when people don't even particularly want it, they prefer yeah, to right. go more naturally for the latter years. That's of right, course, that's when right. people are very ill. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, they've had their life and say it's time to say goodbye. Yeah. Go out gracefully. Yeah. yeah. But with the huge numbers of diabetics and all, of course, you're going to have all of that discomfort well, it, 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 it's, it's got to get worse. Mm. And I think the 
And what I, what I, what's particularly nasty is the dementia and the Alzheimer's. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. actually will really fear Alzheimer's yeah. and it's gone through the roof in the last 30, 40 years. But oh. many people may not be aware that there's emerging theories and hypotheses that are very well grounded that Alzheimer's is really type 3 diabetes. That's right, that's it's right. an insulin dysfunction in the brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can kind of start adding Alzheimer's onto obesity, diabetes, many of the cancers, um, and not everything, but to be honest, all this yeah. modern disease yeah. explosion. Well, yeah. I mean, in the first instance, you've got the damage that the excess insulin does to the internal organs. Mm. And then on top of that, once the pancreas gives up the bones. You've got the sugars that are just let, let loose yeah. and you know they latch onto the proteins and all the rest of it and you know in simplistic terms they just cause internal chaos don't they? Absolutely and inflammation and damage and they wreak havoc but that, that's a very good point actually the hyperinsulinemia uh, causes damage to the, the linings of the arteries and many other that's organs right, yeah, yeah. the kidney of course yeah, yeah, and yeah, diabetics yeah, 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 yeah. even before the blood sugar yeah, you control. know, all, all these ages with a, a, a advanced glycemic end products where oh, the yes. sugars stick to the proteins. Yeah. But by the, way, by the way, did you know that fructose uh, has got seven times more the affinity for proteins than glucose does? Yeah, actually, I, I did come across that. Yeah. Not the exact factor, but, yeah, yeah. but fructose is far more damaging to your proteins and yeah. your blood cells yeah, 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 than yeah. glucose. Yeah. And, it, and it also then is processed in the liver, like you said, and it tends to promote insulin resistance, which right. means you'll need higher insulin now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And your glucose levels will be higher. Yeah, but yeah. it's very interesting that the high insulin, a problem in itself, and over time then, you lose control of your blood sugar, so you've got high yeah, blood sugar right. yeah. with yeah, the I mean, high that, insulin. That's, that's, Synergy. That, that's when you're really in trouble, isn't it? That's when the, in my view, or the way I view it is, that's where the fire inside really gets blazing. Yeah. When you yeah. have hyperinsulinemia and the hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, yeah. both of them, bad actors, together working. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's yeah. where I think the heart attacks really go up off yeah. the roof yeah. of scale. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to come back to the fat and the carbohydrates, because of course one of the big problems we have mm. is all these health professionals who are telling us that we have to have carbs for, yeah. for energy. And of course the whole thing is just rubbish. Meaning I mean, as, uh, as I see it, we've, we've got these two gears. Mm. We've got the carb gear and we've got the fat gear. Mm. And a lot of people never get out of the carb gear, do they? They're stuck at high it's a bit, it's a, well, and then, or, or another analogy is it, it, it's you know, you're lighting the fire and you've got kindlers and you've got your coal in your locks. Mm. And if you're living on carbs all the time, it's like trying to keep your fire going when kindlers are low, isn't it? That's it. Keep it blazing. And um, if you want to yeah. get, get your coal and your hard logs on that are mm. keeping the thing going on a regular basis, and it, it's the same in the body, you know, that, that, uh, that they're all the fat. Yeah. And uh, remember Jason Fung, uh, oh, yes, he made the point wrong. that he, he just puts people on a starvation diet for a while mm. and it's just to get the fat burning function working properly. Exactly. And so away, uh, away you go. Yeah, and I've even heard it described as a low carbohydrate diet is kind of has similar physiological effects to starving yourself. If you starve yourself, you switch on fat burning quite quickly, yeah. your blood glucose goes down, yeah. your insulin goes down, yeah. and you're now rapidly getting very healthy. Yeah. But if you eat a low carb diet, you can achieve that kind of effect without particularly starving yourself. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, why yeah, it's going yeah. to be so popular. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that there's, the, there's a difference between people who just want to improve their health and the ones who already got an illness. So, mm. uh, I mean, in my case, once I got into this, I uh, reduced the amount of potatoes, the amount of, you know, mm. right. so I can say that for an Irish man. Yeah, <laughs> Cut out spuds a bit. Heresy. Uh, and bread, and mm. gradually increased the, the amount of fat. And I mean, w without actually trying, I actually lost a stone in weight. Yeah, that is. I, well, I wasn't particularly bothered about that, but that's mm. just what happened. Yeah, and I lost two stones or 30 pounds within eight or nine weeks. 
Now that won't happen for everyone, but it's probably important to know switching to low carbohydrate will be way healthier for most people. Oh, absolutely. If, yeah, and even if the weight doesn't fall off metabolically, they'd be much well, healthier. Mm. I think we need to have another look at weight because mm. weight per se is not necessarily a problem unless yeah. you're very, very seriously overweight. Um, and of course, the uh, what seems to happen is, is with the high carb diet, you the the glucose. Sorry, with the high carb, yeah, the glucose is pushed to the liver, and the liver converts most of that into fat. Mm. So what happens then is that you you've got fatty liver, you've got high fat in the blood. Mm. And you've got the fat being deposited in the cells, which is where, where the weight comes on. But uh, what, what Jason Funk were finding is, is that within days, the fatty liver disappears. Yes. Uh, and if it's weight you're concerned about, well, that may take a matter of weeks or months. Mm. But the important thing is that within a very short period of time, you're actually improving the quality of your health. Yeah, hugely. You're getting rid of the fatty liver, which of course is tied up with alcohol consumption and all the rest Absolutely. of it. And fatty li liver is an epidemic in itself, yeah. uh, in the US particularly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But people think there's a fatty liver epidemic, there's an obesity epidemic, there's a diabetes epidemic, but they're so intricately linked together Absolutely. With, with the root cause of bad food that really, why don't people just work on the root cause, the excessive, dense, yeah, excessive yeah, yeah. carbohydrate? Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, again, industry is built on carbohydrates. Yeah. It'll take time to deconstruct those enormous buildings. Yeah. Up to but can we just come back to weight yeah. for a minute? Because the, I came uh, across a very interesting thing, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to dig into the diabetes thing a bit more at the moment. Mm. And of course, the, you probably know, I would the, a, lot, a lot of the conventional advice is, if you've got diabetes, you've got to lose weight. Yeah, of course. Mm. Uh, and how you lose it, of course, is, is another issue. But of course, the fact of the matter is, many people who are not overweight have got diabetes. Yes. And what I discovered the other day is that if you've got diabetes, then the best weight is actually a BMI of 30 to 35. Oh, statistically, yeah, it's the yeah, safer. Yeah. And, if you, and, and if you're normal weight, and your chance of dying diabetes, if you've got it, is mm -hmm. twice as high. Wow. If you've got a BMI 30 to 35. So the whole weight thing needs to be explored in a greater in, mm. in greater detail. And certainly reducing weight is not necessarily the answer. And of course the other thing is that approaching this from a conventional standpoint, the way in which people go about losing weight is to reduce their calories. Mm. Which invariably means reducing the fat. Yeah, unfortunately. And the reality is that very few people succeed mm. in losing weight. And in fact, the reality is that the only ones that succeed are the ones who starve themselves. Yeah, thank you. So, not surprisingly, yeah. once they're off the program, they put the weight back on. And they can fly back on as well. They're almost yeah. like a coiled spring. To bounce the weight, yeah. but on that, when I'm, there may be mechanisms around that. That if you're a higher weight, your body is able to relatively safely store the fat out in the periphery. Uh, but the slim people with diabetes who have a lot of in, inter-organ and yeah, liver yeah, fat, yeah, 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 yeah. they're really inflamed. Yeah. So that so it's interesting. Weight yeah. cannot be used yeah. really as, as a no, proper no, measure. No. In, in 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 actual fact, mm. um, fitness is probably much more important. Yes. And uh, I mean, there's no question, uh, a fit, fat person is healthier than a slim, unfit, uh, yes, uh, yeah. a slim, unfit person. Absolutely. And the measures for that, um, well, measuring by weight for metabolic health is very weak and, and contradictory, yeah, yeah. depending. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and of course, measuring cholesterol is irrelevant because you must know the blood sugar status and the insulin yeah, yeah, status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So probably now, the measures that are best for metabolic health are triglyceride over HDL ratio and fasting yeah. insulin 
and HbA1c for your blood yes, glucose. Yes, yes, yes. These are all the measures that really tell you whether you're safe or in danger. Yeah. And but uh, doctors, and yet, yet, yet we're wasting shed loads of money on testing for cholesterol and all this kind of stuff. It, it is kind of insane. Do you see in the next decade now the real measures for health, which actually are useful, that we mentioned, those getting deployed in the next 10 years and pulling away from the whole cholesterol? Well, logically that should happen, but there's no guarantee that logic will be followed. Although, uh, I mean, in, in the UK now, no doubt in, uh, elsewhere, there are efforts being made to tackle diabetes, but I can't say I've got any great confidence in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I came across um, it was an interesting letter in, in the time actually a couple of days ago from a professor in Sheffield, mm -hmm. and he came up with a suggestion uh, which was that you should give people the uh, equipment or the material to enable them to test their blood glucose for two months. Mm. so that they can learn what foods are pushing up the glucose. Right. And he said, do that, let them learn themselves, let them take control, and away you go. Now, mm. that would be a very interesting policy initiative, if anybody would ever pick up on it. Because one of the things that comes through from the case studies of people who've cured their own diabetes mm. is, I went to the doctor and I was told, either by, by the doctor or by the dietitian to whom I was referred, that I had to reduce my fat mm. because of the risk of heart disease yeah. and increase my complex carbs. Mm. I did that. I tested my blood glucose and I found that if I ate rice or pasta or bread, my blood glucose went up. Mm. Shot up. So mm. my attitude was to hell with that. Mm. Uh, I'll dig into the internet and I'll, I'll find the alternatives and many of them have discovered that the way in which they control their diabetes is to reduce their carbohydrates and increase their fat. And I say you can look on the internet, there are hundreds of examples of people who have done that. Mm. And, doctors. And, and then they go back to the doctor, you get the occasion one, you say that's great, tell me more and I'll pass on to my other patients. The vast majority say I don't believe you, go away. Yeah, they'll refuse to believe because of the 50 years of yep. kind of brainwashing yeah, uh, yeah. still in place. But if everyone was measuring their blood glucose and tracking, yeah, you would get... Well, the message is spread for a start because they compare notes, wouldn't they? Well, they'd start comparing notes and realising and hearing about lower carbohydrate and beginning to, the penny to drop that type 2 diabetes is a disease of high insulin and insulin resistance and hyperinsulinia. So the root cause driving high insulin is carbohydrate, more carbohydrate and protein to an extent, more insulin, more disease. So taking away the root cause, you mentioned earlier, focus on the root cause, which medicine Absolutely. doesn't seem to focus yeah. on. Yeah. Take away the root cause, replace with healthy fat, um, and bring down the insulin and help the disease. Yeah. But you, you, won't, you won't believe this. Mm. We've got a, a massive mm. program coming forward in the UK called the National Diabetes Prevention, Pro Prevention Program. Uh -huh. And uh, NICE and the NHS, you know, NICE, yeah. National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, have been sitting down and pulling people together and deciding what they need to do. Now what I've discovered there is that uh, their definition of type 2 diabetes is that uh, there's a shortage of insulin. A shortage of yeah, insulin. Yeah, the people wow. are not producing enough insulin, mm. which is unbelievable. Mm. Fine for type 1, yeah. but not, not for type 2. And they've, they've stopped at that point. I mean, what they should have done was say, right, why mm. is there a need for more insulin? And of course, the answer is obvious, is because there's so much glucose in the blood. How do you, yeah. how do you change that? Take the glucose out. Absolutely. Problem gone. Yeah, Insulin yeah. resistance. But of course, yeah. what you see is, is, is then masses and masses of appendices that they produced about all the drugs. 
oh yeah it's they're it's uh, dripping with drugs that's yeah. the whole focus is yeah. what drugs can we use and yeah yeah it's tragic and of course insulin itself insulin itself has risen in price uh, hugely in the last few years for a drug that's 100 years old yeah. and again it's just such a a cash cow insulin yeah. when the world is exploding with diabetes becomes a great thing to milk for for cash and revenue which is terrible but that's but the, if you look at it from the individual's perspective mm. the last thing you need to be doing is giving them insulin giving them more insulin the very because that, that that's what's causing all the problems it it's absurd and it, it, it beggars belief it does really in an engineering world where i kind of reside you know if you had a problem like this it would be identified very rapidly that the insulin is too high the system is resisting the action of insulin the glucose mm -hmm. is too high mm -hmm. and then over time you burn out your pancreas yeah. and what's driving insulin is mostly carbohydrate uh, and protein to an extent yes. so you'd simply take away the root cause but they add the cause they add more insulin Absolutely. and it, it kind of keeps someone from going out of control but it also poisons them over time yeah, because yeah. insulin damages yeah. So it's absurd, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. the Joslin Diabetes Centre, which is pretty orthodox, recently the head of that came out with a statement that if we have any chance of stopping the diabetes and obesity epidemics, we need to reverse the guidelines and go below 40% carbohydrate in the diet. Yeah, yeah. So there are some green shoots of hope. Oh, yes, yes. And, um, I mean, what, what I find so disappointing is, is that there doesn't seem to be, certainly in my experience, there doesn't seem to be any, any politician that's capable of grasping that. I mean, I sent a load of stuff through my Member of Parliament, mm. which was forwarded to the Minister for Health, and I got a reply back which uh, effectively told me to get lost. <laughs> uh, and mm. the, you know, I, I, I explained in detail what mm. I thought was the the problem with the root of the, the, the root of the problem and pointing out the consequences. Now, any politician with um, an ounce of wit ought to have seen that mm -hmm. here is a way forward to solve what's a massive problem for yeah. them because uh, in, in the UK, diabetes costs 10 billion a yeah, year. That's enormous. Um, mm -hmm. And that's before you can't, you know, for any economic losses, that's simply the costs of, of treatment. Mm. So, uh, um, I mean, in terms of the whole national health expenditure, that's a substantial proportion, mm. and all the signs are that it's getting worse. Now, had that politician had any sense, mm. uh, she would have said to her civil servants, right, tell me why this guy is wrong. Yeah. But as far as I can see, they didn't even read it. All of them said, well, you know, this guy's not quite reliable. Forget it. That's, yeah, and easier to ignore. But then again, teaching a politician kind of complicated uh, scientific things, probably like teaching a fish to ride a bicycle. Yeah, but this, is, this isn't complicated. I, I know, I'm that's aware. the irony. Uh, 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 well, certain people will present it as being complicated, I, but the reality yeah. is, once you get right down to it, mm. it's simple cause and effect. It, it is simple, but... If it's put simply and clearly, the other side will bury it in addendums yeah. or appendices yeah. Yeah. and data. Yeah. Yeah. And politicians, at the best of times, they got there not through being astute technical people for physics and chemistry and, you know, yeah. I suppose. We, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Yeah. And anyway, my strategy now is mm. approach it from the grassroots level. And, you know, get individuals mm. and then the pressure will build up. And I, I think the more people find out for themselves the, the, the reality. I mean, what, what happens now if a person is diagnosed with diabetes is they will be told, it's tough. Mm. We can't do anything about it. It's going to get worse and you can expect to be on drugs for the rest of your life. And the whole thing is rubbish. Ab absolutely. For the vast majority, yeah, absolutely rubbish. Uh, okay, I mean, there may be some 
people where mm. there is permanent damage. But I mean, mm. I would bet a pound to a penny that if they went on to an old car diet, at, at best they wouldn't get any worse. Yeah, an overwhelming majority will, because it's the root cause, yeah. will of course get vastly better. Maybe exactly. not 100% cured, yeah, yeah, but yeah. they'll be off all the meds. Uh, yeah, yeah. I agree. The grassroots point is key, and I mean, it, even this is part of that. There's a growing community of scientists, uh, doctors of chemistry, biochemistry, and like yourself, yeah. and engineers, computer programmers. There's a vast array of technical people now who have realized what we're talking about and have gone researching themselves and can find the material now. And it's growing. And I think you're right. Grassroots is what will force the politicians, the medical profession to actually wake up to root cause reality and how we can Well, I, I think the, the great thing is the internet. Yes. Because that just opens up everything. And I couldn't have done what I have done in the last few years without the internet. I mean, if you go back to the days of the interlibrary loans, uh -huh. there is no way I could have had access to the thousands and thousands of papers that I've been able to scan. And of course, most of them aren't of any consequence. And you've got to go through a lot to find the nice yeah. limits that are uh, absolutely important. And uh, that's how you actually make progress. But, but before, there was no way that I could ever have got to what uh, what's absolutely crucial in terms of understanding what's going on and being able to suggest ways forward. Yeah, access to the data and access to the community and and this interview was brought to you also by the internet. Hopefully you'll be watching it on the internet. <laughs> uh, this I like. Thanks very much, okay, uh, Doctor right, Wheelock, okay. and uh, delighted to talk to you again. Yeah. I'm sure we'll be meeting soon, maybe yeah, in the yeah. UK. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay.